or the city and country, because I'm not going to assume that everybody here was born in you know, California or Indiana or the state of Maine. That's number one. The second thing, I want you to write something that is going to remind you um, of something about you that nobody in this room knows. So if you're really good friends, you're going to have to dig down deep, okay? Um, but if you don't know very many people, uh, just something that people don't know about you, okay? And then the third thing, yeah, do that. I'll give you a couple seconds. If you're not quite done, you know, give me this so that I know that I'm not going to move on. Okay, the next, the next thing I want you to, and I'll give you the instructions first and we'll do it together. I'm going to want you to close your eyes and want you to take a deep breath through your nose, hold it for three or four or five seconds, slowly exhale through your mouth and sort of quiet your inner life and reach for the word that pops into your heart, the very first word that pops into your heart. It could be joy, it could be peace, it could be the name of your mother or the name of your dog. It could be any of those kind of things. But write down one word that pops into your heart when you have that quiet moment. So you can all do that exercise on your own. Close your eyes, take that breath, Hold it, exhale, find that word. Okay, so three things on the poster. It's very quiet. Everybody done? Got it? Okay. So we're going to share a little bit of that. Of that partly just to start learning about each other at the beginning of this time together. Um, I know Charlotte was born in Fairfield, California. So everybody that was born in California, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, now to make it easier, everybody not born in California, raise your hand. Oh, lots. Good, oh my gosh. Okay, so now this is going to be sort of fun, but we're going to have to do a rapid style or we won't have any time. We are going to be looking for the person who was born farthest away from L.A. So who thinks that they have the place farthest away? Okay. I was born in China. In China? What part of China? What's that? Okay. Can anybody? Oh, 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 oh. I've okay. got Mel oh, ooh, Melbourne, Australia. Okay, who's got their smartphone and the little Google app? How many, how many miles as the crow flies to Melbourne, uh, from Melbourne or China? Or Lebanon. Okay, please, get your smartphones. I'm not going to do that. But let's, let's see, we may have a three-way tie. I know, what would we do without Google, right? Okay, well, I'm going to put you on the spot. So, are you willing to share with us um, that thing that nobody knows about you? I was a volunteer in the 1984 Olympics. Wow. wow. <laughs> uh, I 
I wish we had enough time for everybody to tell that particular thing about yourself that nobody else in the room knows, but we're going to do this. I want you to turn to people at your table, preferably somebody that you don't know, but if that doesn't work out, that's okay. I want you all, you all know each other? I want you all then to tell that person um, what, what that secret thing is, okay? So just a couple seconds. Tell them, tell them what you, what you uh, wrote down. Somebody sitting next to you, you okay back there? Everybody okay? Need a couple more seconds? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm going to call it time. You've made new friends. Continue that. So the last thing that I ask you to do is to write down Okay, I asked you all to write down then that word that came into your heart after you had just a moment to sort of center yourself and find that peaceful interior. And so I'm just going to point to people and then ask you if you shout something out, then we're going to do something together, and then we're going to get introduced. So I'm looking way over at you. What, what's your word? Yeah, I'm coming to you. Love? Okay, how about you? Love? Integration. Family. Family. Whole. Very different. Trees. Trees. from China. Sleep. Sleep. No sleeping right now. Okay. Now, what I'd like us to do, and then we'll move on with the, with the, the meat of what we're going to do together is we're going to actually all say those words together at the same time, and then I'll have one last exercise, and then I'll be quiet, okay? So when I say three, I want everybody to say that word as loudly or as quietly as you want together. So one, two, three. Yes. Okay. And now we're going to start here, and we're going to sort of do a wave. So and that you're doing the waves with your hand, but you're going to just do it with the voice. And you're just going to go like this, and your each table is going to sort of say their stuff, and hopefully the people at the table don't say it at the same time as well. So ready? We're going to go one, two, three, we're going to start. Lunch.
our next group. This is the Diversify, Uplifting Everyone's Voice to Be Heard. That is being presented by Charlotte R. Richardson, Elisa Dicta, and Stephen Patty. going to, um, over for our, interview, our agenda for today, we're going to give you a brief overview of diversity, and then uh, uh, we're going to let Stephen give you um, his life story, or not life story, but his experience as a patient partner. <laughs> He's going to tell us all about him. And then we're going to hear from Elis Elisa as a half lead, and we're going to do recruiting for diversity. And then we're going to have a discussion. And we're going to set some goals here today, too. So uh, what is diversity to you? Uh, we're going to talk about that in detail. And we're going to do some fun brainstorming activity. And we're going to give you some definitions of diversity. And why is the diversity important? And um, the purpose of the presentation. So I want to go over the purpose of the presentation first. Um, the purpose of the presentation is that 
we feel it is very important to have a diverse council. Um, you don't get to hear everyone's voice, so having a diverse council means a great deal. And diversity is not just race and ethnicity and language. It's about being differently able, um, gender identity, um, neural diversity, it's social economic. So there's a lot of different diverse populations, and we want to make sure that we include all of them because they represent the people that we serve. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move forward with our presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Should we want to tell how the Spanish uh, slide came into being? Sure. Okay. So we have over 400 patient partners in Northern California, and I sent an email out to our patient partner groups, and I asked them, what does diversity mean to you? And we created this word cloud from their responses. And so then Stephen's going to connect that to his story, okay? She sent it out by email and got tons of responses. He said it was a lot, wasn't it? It was a lot. It was a lot. So unlike what we did this morning when we were seeing the stuff come in uh, real time, which was really pretty cool, by the way, uh, these came in over time, and then she, she created uh, this uh, cloud, and this was the reaction from patient partners all throughout Northern California, not just Santa Rosa, where we're talking from. So take a look at that, and then um, I share your, my story. <laughs> so who am I, and why am I here? Um, gosh, uh, 2017, Santa Rosa fire, Northern California, lots of smoke, uh, lots of uh, homes burned, uh, lives lost. I was getting ready for retirement, and I've been a lifelong asthmatic under good care with, uh, with Kaiser, um, but the smoke really did a number on me, not surprising. I contacted my primary care physician, said I was having trouble breathing, and he's like, yeah, you and everybody else. <laughs> By the way, we weren't just burning forests, we were burning homes with all their contents, uh, insulation, furniture, you know, all kinds of stuff. So the air was thick with all kinds of toxic, toxic smoke. We've all learned so much about this now in California with all the fires that we've had, how bad all of that is. Um, and so that was what happened to me. Um, I did retire. He said, give it about six months. Let me know if that's uh, not any better. And six months, and here I'm retired and spending even more time exercising and trying to, and still having difficulty. So he goes, okay, well, let's get you in and we'll let you see a pulmonologist. So I had a pulmonary workup, which I hadn't had for a long time. I had asthma starting in my 20s. Um, and, uh, she tweaked my meds. I felt great, probably the best I've felt in uh, 15 years. I'm like, great. So now I'm retired, getting ready to turn 60. And she says, you know what? That's a good age. Let's start doing some baseline studies. Why don't we start with a cardiologist? I'm like, OK. Um, two weeks later, I was in San Francisco. I flunked my angiogram. They wouldn't let me out of the hospital until I had quadruple bypass surgery four days later. By the way, what you see is what you get. I, I didn't have a, a cholesterol issue. I didn't have high blood pressure. I had no signs whatsoever other than the fact that I had asthma that had been diagnosed when I was 27 years old. So she saved my life. The cardiac surgeon saved my life, right? Um, so that's how it all started. Uh, and so the first words, really, when they came in and sort of said, you know, you're, you're not going home and you can't until you've had this, was, you know, what did I do to deserve this? And it's an understandable first outcry from any sick and suffering person, but in time for many, the question evolved to be something more like, if this happened to me, what do I do now? And who is there to help me? And of course, Kaiser was great. They were there to help me. They, uh, um, uh, rallied around, surrounded by doctors and nurses and physical therapists and, and all of that. So it was a successful surgery, great outcome. And then the, uh, the 
crack that I got infected, and I was rehospitalized now back in Santa Rosa, and it seemed for a brief period that the, the, the cost of having a healed heart was going to be the amputation of my leg below my knee. And I didn't think that that was a good trade-off, but if so be it, that's what, that's what seemed to be coming down my way. My hospitalist, Dr. Reed, uh, at Santa Rosa, um, worked with me to get uh, the infection cleared and, uh, and followed up. And in the course of those conversations, she asked me if I was interested in becoming a patient partner. I had no idea what a patient partner was. You know, I really didn't. Um, and I'd been with Kaiser since 1996. I'd never heard of the patient partner program. So I quickly sort of said yes, and then said, but I want to do some research first. So you're going to get a quick story of my research, and this may be you know, recapping for you, but I figured that this is worth uh, things to, to um, uh, go over again today when we're here at a PSCC conference. Um, I'm a bit of a tech guy. I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm certainly a lifelong learner. So instead of cracking the book, I went to Google and uh, you know, typed in patient partner. You know, what is this thing? What is this movement? So I discovered that the term patient-centered care was actually coined 35 years ago in 1988 by what's now called the Picker Institute as a call to attention for the need for clinicians, staff, and healthcare systems to shift their, shift their focus away from diseases and back to the patient and family. The term was meant to stress the importance of better understanding the experience of illness and of addressing patients' needs within an increasingly complex and fragmented healthcare delivery system. And by the way, has our healthcare system become more complex and more fragmented in the last 35 years? Yeah, okay. So uh, eight characteristics of care were identified as the most important indicators of quality and safety and, um, and from the perspective of patients. Respect for patients' values, preferences, and expressed needs. Coordinated and integrated care. Clear, high quality information and education for the patient and for the family. Probably their first time having this disease, okay? The doctors may know it all, but this is new for them. Physical comfort, including pain management. Emotional support and alleviation of fear and anxiety. Involvement of family members and friends as appropriate. And finally, continuity, including uh, care site transitions, and access to care. The last one is access to care, and guess what? In 35 years, have we improved very much on access to care either? No. So we've got a lot of work to do. For me, the real touchstone was, though, 25 years ago, Valerie Bonian voiced, nothing about me without me. And that has become my touchstone as a patient partner Nothing about me, nothing about you as a patient, nothing about you as a person without you, without involving you. Um, and successfully addressing those dimensions requires enlisting patients and families and allies in designing, implementing, and evaluating care systems. We're talking about building care systems. In one of the sessions I was this morning, they were talking about, at Cedar Sinai, they were talking about actual physical layout of the rooms and what should be in those rooms. Patients should be part of all of that. Um, the talk about patient-centered care is sort of ubiquitous now in healthcare, isn't it? We all talk about it. We all say it, but what does it actually mean? One of the greatest challenges of turning rhetoric into reality continues to be routinely engaging patients decision making, and that really brings us to our discussion today. How do we bring those patients in? And to successfully address this critical component of quality and safety, we must break down the, the critical barriers between clinicians and patients. Patients should be educated, back to those eight points, about the essential role they play in decision making and be given effective tools to help them understand their options and the consequences of those decisions. They should also receive the emotional support they need to express their values and preferences and be able to ask questions without censure uh, from their clinicians. Patients need to be taught that the delivery of medicine is not something to them. 
but something done with them. The old model of medicine is the doctor does something to you. That's gone. It's something that we do together. We're on this journey together. Clinicians, in turn, need to relinquish their role as the single paternalistic authority and train to become more effective coaches or partners, learning, in other words, how to ask what matters to you, not just what's the matter, not what's just the chief complaint, right? But what matters to you? What are your values? What do you want? What does your family want? What matters to you? That's at the heart of, the, of, of, of the, that relationship, should be. But you know what, true converse, uh, con communication and conversation is difficult. In our own lives, in our own families, uh, there's oftentimes misunderstanding and miscommunication. We grow up in family units where we have just the emotional and psychological the tools to deal with um, you know, that we learn from our parents. If we're good, we learn things from our, our friends. We branch out. Maybe we uh, marry somebody or date somebody who uh, is different. And so that world continues to grow. But for the most part, we're really quite impaired as humans understanding other human beings. I really believe that. But I think that the, the opportunities to really understand where another person has walked and where they have lived and how their experience of reality is tough, you have to spend time to do that, right? And now I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about relationships that may be the core of your family. Now when you talk about that being part of what needs to happen in the clerical setting, we don't have time for that. Right? We've got 15 minute appointments, 20 minute appointments. Who has the time to really take the time to do that? But that's that's the challenge. And so there needs to be more opportunities for clinical training to learn how to work with diverse populations whose life experiences may be quite different than ours. And look at how the city of LA is kind of broken down in terms of people and background and languages. Um, but we also need to train our people and our patients to be partners as well and to see themselves as, as the center of their care experience. We need to empower them. And that comes with risk in a clinical environment because it'd be really easier if we just did something to somebody as opposed to just decide to do a partnership. But we need to do the partnership. Fundamentally, we're all humans. We're actually all the same. And yet, we're all individual. You all had individual words when I asked not some of you have the same, but different words about what was in your heart. We heard trees, okay? We heard love. We had different kinds of things that were there that were core to what our being is and what our values are. Um, and so our stories and our lives and what matters to all of us is different and it must be understood even in that medical matrix and that medical uh, complexity. So for me, what matters to me? What matters to the heart of that relationship with our clinical team. What matters? What now that this has happened, what are we going to do? What are we going to do together? So we're going to go back to our icebreaker for just a second. This was uh, the, the, the the title of this is uplifting or be voiced, right? When I got that from Charlotte, my brain went immediately to the wonderful song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. If you don't know that song, you should learn it and you should uh, listen to it. It's a fabulous, fabulous song. So lift every voice and sing. So I want you to, together again, we're going to shout out that secret thing that you told your friend, okay, your new friend, and you're going to shout out also the secret from your heart. That's the beginning of each of you as individuals, and that's the beginning of your healthcare journey. It should always be at the heart of your healthcare journey. And I hope that you all make that so. Thank you. And so I'm going to do one, two, three. I'm going to say lift every, I'm not going to sing the song. I'm going to say lift every voice and sing. And then I want you to tell the, the secret thing about you and your special word. So all together, we're going to do this. One, two, three. Lift every voice and sing. And? There you go. <laughs> oh, come on. We can do that. <laughs> Sorry, it's the old preacher in me. We're going to try it one more time because we're going to do it with, with um, we're not going to do it with song necessarily, but we're going to do it with some energy. So we're going to do, I'm going to do one, two, three. I'm going to say lift every voice and sing. 
you know, there's some, these are the chaotic cacophony of beautiful thing names that. So, one, two, three, lift every voice and sing. Thank you.
make sure that we have representation across the board and constantly um, re-evaluating that. Um, so that's sort of where we're at in our passing and my experience in doing it. So it's, it's a process, but I think the value is so incredibly important um, and just really brings to the forefront uh, our patients within our medical center because everybody is really busy. I think this is like, you know, the 15 minutes, but even in this the nurses on the floor, everybody's got kind of their goal. So kind of connecting them and reminding them like, oh yeah, that's why we're here. And also by listening to our patients' voices and our voices now in, you know, project design, um, uh, you know, feedback and so forth, we're actually saving ourselves time later as well because we've created an optimal design now for everyone. So you're actually alleviating some of the headaches that you might think you, you won't know you had because you've alleviated them now instead of having them down the line and then trying to revisit. Um, so I think earlier, although they were able to fix it, they were talking about one bed instead of two um, uh, at um, Cedar Sinai. Thank you. <laughs> Great thing. Cedar Sinai, but it's the same thing. But how, so it's just so crucial. And then also because of that, and because especially, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles is a incredibly diverse, we do see people from all different backgrounds, ages, and so making sure that we can really make care accessible and, and also in part make it successful so that we know that when people leave our medical center or when they're discharged from the hospital, we're giving them every tool they have to be successful so that they don't return. And so part of that is also, again, integrating that all into our council and have, making sure we try to make, make let that voice be heard um, in every area. So that is my story. Thank you. California, we have over 40 patient advisory councils, over 400 patient advisor, uh, patient partners that we work with. Um, some of the packs that we have are a teen pack, we have a Latinx pack, we have a transgender pack, we have a um, Filipino American pack, we have a TV pack, Chinese pack, I pack. Um, Trying to think of all of them. LGBTQ pack, uh, did I say teen, pediatrics, NICU? Uh, we have quite a few. So, oncology and cardiology. Um, so, we have quite a few packs, and we're, we're really proud of that because we know it's some hard work and um, it takes a lot for our staff to be engaged with that. So, and that's volunteer time on, for them too. So, uh, we're really proud of the packs that we do have. But before we go any further, um, I do want to explain to you that we don't use patient advisors at our hospital. At Kaiser, we change and we are now using patient partners because you are partners to us. And I would like for our lead, Jonathan, to explain why we switched over to patient partner instead of patient advisor. Because you're not advising us, you're partnering with us. This was one of those um, unexpected moments that I got to uh, uh, step in. So I'm kind of excited to do this, I think, but I had to pull up a note really fast. She said, oh, you do such a good job explaining this. Um, I might get a mic here. Hello? Hello, hello? Okay, here we go. All right, so I was thinking about this as we begin to change our terminology, our nomenclature around um, moving from patient advisor uh, to this idea of a patient partner. So um, part of, excuse me, part of what we um, have put down as our purpose, as our, uh, our core value for our PFCC program is this. We recognize that the outcomes for quality, safety, and the delivery of care are improved when the clinical expertise of healthcare providers is partnered with the lived experience and expertise of patients, families, and caregivers. And we really use that then as the basis to think about um, how we were gonna change our terminology. So we have this really strong partnership uh, tradition at Kaiser. So we have physician partners, 
we have labor partners. Why don't we have patient partners? Um, I will tell you, we're thinking about changing that again. Oh, no. But not from partners. <laughs> we're going to keep the partner okay. part. So anyway. Um, but it also denotes being, um, uh, that our members are full partners in the discussion around designing what care looks like. And it's really important. It's not this that you're coming in, and you're going to give your advice, and you're going to leave. But if we're going to vote on something, if we're all going to come collectively together, then you're a full partner in that discussion. And the final thing, uh, which I think is pretty good, is um, that you, I, as Charlotte said, you offer more than advice. Um, you really are sitting there together with us as healthcare leaders um, in really defining what the outcome is going to be. So there you go. That's why we moved. Um, we still have a few pockets of resistance because, let's be honest, um, we've been really, really used to using the term patient advisor for a long time. Um, and you know, we have a pretty large program. Um, we have over 1,100 patient partners. We have 92 patient advisory councils across our enterprise, um, which I don't think is nearly enough because we represent 12.5 million members, so we should be doing a lot more. Um, and we're working on that. But um, if we're truly going to have the best outcomes, then we've got to be partnered together. So thank you for those of you who bring your lived experience, and thanks to the rest of you who bring your clinical expertise, because together we come up with the best outcomes. So now we're going to get up and move in a second. So my particular brainstorming activity, we're going to, we're going to use our sticky notes again and your uh, uh, markers. And very simple. And to some degree it's a no-brainer, but I think we're going to discover things about the answers to these questions that are going to be different than what we just uh, think might be coming out of the box. So why do you think it's important to have a diverse council you can put multiple words on the stickies if you want, or each individual one. When you're done with what you have, come up and place them on here. We're going to sort of put the ones that are like uh, next to each other, but we're going to see what kind of a picture we um, create. And then we're going to tear this off and put this over so we can see it later on, because we're going to be doing this in a, in a couple other, with a couple other questions. So why do you think it's important to have a diverse council? Seems like a self-evident question, but you guys get to answer it. Why? Why is diversity important? Why is the first council important? And when you're done, you can actually walk up. I'm going to have you get up and walk. Okay, watch the chairs and stuff like that. But come on up and walk it on. Okay, different perspectives, inclusive product. Different ideas and input, inclusive, and they're rearranged as we go. Um, ethics and cultures, different. Better understand different needs to be able to serve people better through this understanding, good. The best represent the community we, uh, that we serve, to represent the diverse uh, population we serve. Keep going, I'll get out of the way. We'll need some more. If you see one that's like yours, put it on top of it or next to it. Okay? And this will be available for everybody to look at and take pictures of afterwards, too. Okay? And we'll see if we can transcribe it and get it out to everybody. People still writing? Not everyone has the same experience. Because our world is diverse and the human experience is part of all of us. Improved outcomes. I like that. Okay, sometimes this is uh, hooked in with outcomes and, you know, reimbursements and scores and all that kind of stuff, right? So how do we improve that? Okay, healthcare equity. No people, two people are alike to meet the needs of the diverse patient better, unique perspectives. What you got? Yep. Collaborating to make changes with patient partner voice. Okay. We serve all people. We need to hear all people. You said what? Don't look at that one. <laughs> okay, that's 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 too much. That represent different lived experiences, different points of view, help ident identify areas for improvement for sure. Experience hearing diverse opinions. People develop more compassion. Absolutely. We were talking on the on the brief taxi ride up today. How important 
it was um, for those of us who have the opportunity to, to live and work overseas, whether as an exchange student in high school or at other parts of our lives, what the, probably one of the most amazing experiences that I think people can have to just sort of get broken out of where, it, where they're used to and to discover the other cultures, other languages. Okay, there's a lot on there. And yeah. is there anyone who was able to keep their post it up that you want me to pick up? Yes, thank you. So. No? Okay. Okay. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to write these all down on my computer. So when you contact us later on, if you want to, we'll have all of these things written out for you as well. Here's what we came up with, and I think you all improved. Look, did I skip over it? No, that was just for them. Telling us why they thought that okay. was ready. Didn't we have a list? <laughs> no. No, you didn't have a list. Oh, that was our that was our internal work list. We'll share it with you. Well, yours is much better than ours. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> so this is my brainstorming activity. Uh, name some ways to recruit for diversity. So if you can take some of your post-its. And write down. Uh, wait. Want some more? <laughs> okay. What's that? Are we all out? Oh, low on posters? Okay. This is also for recruiting. I'll put this over here. People want to write directly on it. Something staff support services staff nominate patients uh, to be our to be 
are connecting, partner with high schools, okay? partner with community organizations, offer flexible terms for participation, community outreach already to diverse outlets, targeted marketing. We saw some marketing uh, for those of those who were in the Peter Sinai work this morning, um, both internal to your organization as well as external. Um, ask healthcare staff to recruit at community events, intentionally recruit, use the diverse team you have to reach out to others in that community, create awareness in underserved communities, flyers, materials in non-English languages, advertise community organizations, patient experience surveys that include nationality demographics, am I reading that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. A direct approach, promising candidates, oh, a directly approach promising candidates and ask them. Um, the woman at Peter Sinai said she routinely uh, walks up to people in the hallways and asks them, build community partners. Um, yeah, anything else that's not up here? There's four over here, oh. partner with community organizations who serve different groups, community outreach, different language <coughs> marketing, uh, rewrite from service providers and community partners, and I'm uh, sorry, recruit from service providers and community partners, consult other programs, counter community and area eateries, oh that's a good one, ask for help from places that already serve the greater population. For those of you that were in the Cedar sinai one this morning, it was interesting that of the half-on question at the end of the, the survey that allowed them to sort of opt in to whether you'd be willing to receive surveys in the, in the future was great. They have 28,000, 30,000 people that they had that they were able to survey on a regular basis, and they're sort of using that um, as a way of, of being able to get um, some of that feedback and talk to leads and to identify people. I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, so we have some ways that we have listed on here, how to recruit for diversity, um, connecting with medical staff, doctors, nurses, social workers, etc. connecting with public affairs, marketing, public relations, IT, communication department, collaborate with community leaders, posters and flyers, Newsletters, club engagement, the ombudsman, advice nurse, other volunteers or patient partners and advisors, email letters, and patient member satisfaction club service. Hey Charlotte, before you move to that next one, I'll say um, I'm so amazed. I've been a patient partner for about uh, four years, and I'm still amazed when I run into Kaiser members, you know, who may be just being served by the organization well, who still know nothing about patient partner. They always go surprised when I tell them what I do. They're like, what? What is it for you? Um, so again, I think the internal marketing for the organization and the external facing, depending on however your healthcare systems are set up and your membership, um, should, should continue to, to be an important part. Very thank you. So, um, in part, oh, just one question. Oh, I was just curious and following up on one of those, um, can we rope compensate them for their experience yeah. or their expertise, which I think is a huge piece that we haven't yeah. talked about yet? I think that was you. Yep. Um, and <laughs> well, I was just curious, does, does Kaiser compensate? No. Okay. So, uh, have there been discussions around that, or kind of what's the thinking there? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, uh, does Kaiser compensate our patient partners for their volunteer work? And they, uh, just like I believe it was Cedar, uh, we, no, we did not. <laughs> um, they're considered volunteers um, under a volunteer program. Um, so we, we just do not. And also, there, I mean, there's other reasons why. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I should answer something. That's okay. I'm, not, yeah. and I'm like totally not trying to put anybody on blast. I'm more just curious of like, how it's because I think that's true of a lot of places, yeah, right? right? That there, it's like, well, there isn't funding or there isn't whatever. 
whatever. And Tiger is kind of one, like Peter, right? It's like yes. one of those big organizations. There's a fair amount of money. Like, so in terms of, I'm just curious about what the different barriers are, right, that we experience. And, well, I would, I would say as leading that, um, the thing that I get pushed, again, all, all the time is we don't have, I, I know people say, well, you're a large organization. You've got ample dollars. That so everybody can hear. <laughs> People say you're a large organization, you've got ample dollars, um, and we don't. <laughs> we're running just as tight as everyone else, um, and and when I raise that, I get laughed at. Oh yeah, we don't have the money, and so and then the the thing that I get scared about is we say, well, um, you know, if you want to attract diverse people and you want to you know design for the margin and you want to get out to those that aren't heard and bring those voices in which is what we want to do and yet um, the way to do it then is you need to you know provide incentives or stipends or dollars to do that and I get that but then we don't have the dollars so is that going to be then our excuse for not actually being out there and working in those communities and bringing those voices in because most of us are faced with the fact that we don't have the dollars. Thank you. I feel like um, there's well, that's part of what recruiting around barriers is a really good oh. one. And here are one more question. Oh, sorry. Hi, I just wanted to comment on that. Anna Gorman from LA County Department of Health Services. Um, so I would just challenge everybody to start thinking about the compensation question. Um, there are lots of people who cannot afford to take the time away from their lives and their days and their child care to be able to participate. Um, you know, we serve vastly, mostly Medi-Cal, Medi Medicaid patients or uninsured patients, and they are truly the experts, as we are all saying all day long. And we get compensated, and um, we should compensate them as well. And I realize that there are concerns about money, there's maybe concerns about legality or whether they're considered employers, all these employees and all these things. But I think there's creative solutions with philanthropy or going to the C-suite and making the case. So I would just challenge us all to think about that and maybe next year we'll have some really good examples of how we're doing that to encourage those diverse voices to come in. I was thinking we were having this conversation on barriers if people wanted to either write or just shout out barriers. And I have some like kind of follow up to that. Uh, but I want to give everyone else a chance to share what you either have experienced as barriers or what um, you might think would be a barrier. That's a very good one. Um, to this question and the last one, I think often for these programs when people are volunteering or they are actively recruited, we miss the people that fall out or aren't, you know, they're lost to follow up, they're not, they're potential Kaiser patients, but not Kaiser patients, because they're in the geographic area. So I wonder with the recruitment question or maybe more of this question, um, what efforts have you guys done to actively reach out to people that are lost to follow up or in your communities, like geographic communities, but maybe not the Kaiser community, for example. Um, I don't know. I can, I can speak to something and have something to add. Um, I started as a patient partner um, before COVID, so we actually had in-person stuff. And for me, it was a way of giving, giving back. I was retired. I mean, a 64-year-old cis white male who happens to be gay and uh, American Indian as well, but still. I, you know, I sort of fit a particular demographic. I've got the time, I've got the means to be able to do this kind of volunteer work. You don't need a lot more people like me. You need other people that represent the community. And we had some of that um, four years ago when I started. And then when we went um, uh, virtual, we lost a lot of that because the change of the timing of the meetings happened, the technology changes happened. And so we had a lot of people sort of drop off and so we're back now trying to recruit, but we're still not doing a whole lot of things in person. I mean, there are obviously the hospital visits and stays and emergency room stays and, and people are seeing the doctors again, but it's still sort of removed so that recruitment efforts have gotten
gotten really tough. So we look for patient partners to re uh, refer and doctors and all the rest, but reaching in deeply into the Santa Rosa community to make our council reflect what our community looks like um, is a real challenge. And we're really experiencing it at this point because things just haven't normalized post COVID. People are still not going to the places that they used to go and all the rest. And again, the barriers we're having to come up against here, there are quite a few, whether it's uh, money and not being able to, to take that time off, um, access, uh, sometimes it's vehicles, being able to get there if we're going back in person. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of things. Yeah. And um, if, is anybody else have any barriers they would like to Oh, by the way, and I, I get a lot of, I mean, it was funding in person because we had um, meals and the, and the outpouring and the participation from Kaiser um, doctors and nurses and staff is just incredible. And being able to spend that time together is incredible. Um, we get a lot of Kaiser blame. <laughs> so getting lots of different kinds of things that are actually very useful and very thoughtful and tending a very little garden right now where it's kind of just chamomile and peppermint and something else. <laughs> No, I mean, it's great kind of stuff, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice thing. We have um, ineffective communication. And what, and what I mean by that is, just like you said, uh, partnership. And I think sometimes it's not explained to the staff, so sometimes they feel like you're here advocating with the patient versus the staff. And I think it, it gets misinterpreted or it's not communicated, and they look at us as, why are you here? Yeah. And So at least that's my perspective. Um, lack, yeah, it makes sense. Lack of awareness by medical center staff, and um, also uh, not maybe addressing the the angst that comes up when that challenge arises. Should be more of it, and they should be so more awareness. Awareness. We're working together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. And I think what comes with that is though you've got to do. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of control so we don't have conversations going back and forth because everybody can't hear you. So if you give me a minute to come either back to you, if you'll raise your hand so I can get to you so everybody can hear. I'm not trying to be ugly. I just want everybody to be able to no, no, be involved. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Jonathan, did you want to? to you know we go in and we talk to our patient partners around how we're using the term partner right and we, we bring you in and we, we've done a really great job as a partner of helping you understand what your role is but we don't always do such a great job of helping our staff understand the role of the patient partner that we're going to be bringing in so they come in and then they feel right. disrupted and so if we do a good enough job kind of getting everybody to understand getting ready to do, um, that tends to help us out a little bit. It, it, it requires a little labor on our part. I have to say I've rounded in the medical center to kind of promote some of our volunteer programs and with our staff and also our patient advisory council, and that's gone a long way um, to promoting. And I've had nurses now come to me since and say, oh my gosh, I'm so excited that you have this council and we can get feedback from them directly, you know, our patients and hear their voice. And, and it helps them also advocate for whatever. Um, and our hospital is working towards magnet, I guess. And so there's a lot of different uh, nursing councils and stuff. And so it it's really goes a long way um, to have that advocacy. And, and, and for then, I think one staff understand it does make a big difference um, in, in the relationship. And, and um, for sure. Um, I, I think it can be. 
Oh, was there one here? Sorry, I'll let you move to I was going to say, I think it's challenging when there's not, if you're recruiting for something and there's not that same representation on the recruiting team, but the facilities are in place, and it's hard for people to open up if they don't think they're receiving iPads as an entity. so that we can get this voice in our medical clinics for sure is a huge challenge and you know I've gotten I've done things such as like go in person and have you know or have we have a geriatric ED council and you know some people aren't tech savvy so you know I'll, I'll set up office hours and sit with them in my office and we'll do it together um, just led to creative ways to make sure that So the three of us are um, patient advisors. We may become patient partners, <laughs> so, which is in LA County. And this, our council has existed for quite a long time. And we're well integrated into the hospital, into hospital operations, but we are really not diverse. And as I'm listening to this, thinking about the fact that we meet on Fridays from noon to 1.30, um, and I think the activities that we do are mostly during the work day. And I think this is a, this is a problem. When we started our council, we met with um, an existing council in Orange County, and they met after the work day. I don't know this because we went to one of their meetings. It was like a dinner meeting. So I think that's one thing that we, that our group needs to think about. And can we get younger people? And mostly we have retired folks. Um, can we get younger people if we make the timing work for them? The other thing I was going to say is it's my impression that recruiting is most successful when it's person to person. If, if I, whoever I am, if I see you and talk to you about it, you're more likely to. Flyers are great for, for general awareness, but it's most people won't just respond to a flyer. Yeah. 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 Um, I have two points to make. First of all, I wanted to just stress your point that you made before, which is that a lot of people don't know about it. Um, and I, I serve on a board, and that's something that you get invited to. But this is something that is more broad and wide open, and it's it's for any patient, and I just think that people aren't aware of that. Then I was thinking that um, for diversity is um, with like within a network of hospitals or clinics, they're neighborhood by neighborhood, and I agree with you 100%. The invitation one-to-one, -one, I think, is where you get your most guesses. If you can throw a flyer, a flyer out to everybody, I'm not gonna write it. I don't have time, I get so many, I get so much stuff, we all do. 
So, um, but it's that one-on-one, -on -one, and so maybe the clinicians getting involved with inviting people. The other thing is, not everyone is an ideal candidate, if we're honest. I mean, many people are not ideal candidates. Most people are not ideal candidates. But, but people know, you know, if a doctor has a patient, or if, a, if you, you see somebody or know someone that just speaks well, and even if they're angry, if they, they, they discuss it well and, and reasonably and logically, it's like, great. We need you on our committee. You need to get involved. You know, so that one-on-one -on -one invitation, maybe focusing on certain clinics in certain areas, might help. You know, and it, it's not just for you, but it's for all of us in all of our organizations. I mean, really, here. Oh, 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 I just to say, like, really, that's what this is about too: is um, coming together and hearing each other's ideas to help us all in this work. So, yeah. I think that there's just needs to be more outreach because a lot of people are not aware that that opportunity exists. So, um, so uh, I wouldn't say I'm an advisor or partner. I'm more of a patient, um, uh, and so I, I just I kind of just do my own thing. I'm also trying to help out, but what I've noticed is a big barrier is the fact that um, each person is their own individual. They each come from their own history, you know, background, uh, culture, and we don't really try to align with that. We try to put someone who's a professional, I would say, but they don't align with that. And I know that's really hard to do to begin with, um, but like an example I can give up is uh, like um, my doctor, he's, he's Asian, he connects with me amazingly because but when it comes going upstairs, when patients or trying to get people involved, uh, some people are like Latino. And then if you put someone who's more white, who doesn't understand their culture, where they come from, or maybe they're afraid to ask questions, and you don't bring that up, they just won't bring it up, you know? And that's one thing I've noticed is instead of focusing just on the professional, there should be a focus also like who's that individual and where do they come from? But we have, so we're um, in the Bay Area and it's a different healthcare system, but our PFAC is interesting because we have almost like a database where people have opted in to fill in certain demographics. And I think that's really tricky because if you don't have a purpose or you're not transparent about why you're asking it, most people don't trust the healthcare system. So they're not gonna fill in their salary range or their insurance type or what have you. Um, so when you go out and you have all these people, you might not actually know the information that you to know to be able to recruit them, so that has been a huge challenge with us to match people with projects, even though we know we have those individuals and if you are a provider that knows the individuals and they can reach out personally, that's great, but we miss a lot of people um, that way. I was going to say one, um, one other thing I think is a little bit more around retention than it is recruiting is making sure the meetings are really um, friendly and when we talk about communication, that the people running the meetings or, or coordinating the meetings aren't speaking in jargon, aren't using healthcare terminology, even things like patient-centered, or like the general folks like may not know exactly what our, all our healthcare jargon is all about and trying to make it really, really accessible so people keep coming back and so they tell their friends about it. Oh, great. Yeah. great. If I may add on to that, um, also making sure that the folks that are already on your committee are as committed to diversity as you are, yeah. because if it is not a warm and welcoming yeah. committee experience, no matter who you are, uh, you're, you're not going to come back to that. Yeah. So just for time, we're gonna move forward. Oh. There's someone else? When we were two, two more. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to do the three and then we'll call it? Yeah, sorry. Great discussion, though. These are great, yeah. I, I, this is what I love, because I love to hear what everybody thinks. It just makes me think, oh, that's a warm spot I have, too, or whatever. Yeah. One of the things that I have noticed in my experience on the PFAC is sometimes the, um, the, the clinicians that are asked 
to participate. I feel like that the patient's partners or advisors are there to complain about what they do. And so if the, the clinicians and the providers who also need to be of a diverse um, background and so forth to match, the in fact know that we're not there to just tell them how bad they are. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, that we want to be a team and make things better for everybody. Yeah, definitely. We have one young lady here and the young lady in the back in the pink. Yeah, I just wanted to respond. I think throughout the session today, I've heard this idea around like who's a good fit for the partner, and that not everybody is a good fit. And I just wanted to challenge that thinking a little bit and encourage us to think about if we really want diverse perspectives, then we have to find ways of engaging with people in ways that maybe are not a professional setting. It's not looking at a report that has a bunch of data on it that might have acronyms and what have you. You don't necessarily have to have a certain education level or even a certain ability to, you know, around emotional regulation. Like, if you had a terrible experience, then yeah, you should be pissed about that. <laughs> like, being able to show up in an authentic way and share your experience, I think often we want people to arrive at the space in this professional way that we as healthcare professionals are used to, and I would just encourage us to think less about having people come into our world and more about how do we create spaces where people don't have to be a certain way in order to share their, their experience. Yeah, looking for a fit, looking those who might uh, describe as difficult right. challenge. Exactly. Okay. I have two things. I'm very passionate about volunteering. 42 years I've been volunteering. I don't want to be paid. It's my choice, my passion, my caring. You work around it. You've got Saturday and Sunday. If you're too busy, don't volunteer. I don't want a negative person next to me. Special Olympics, USC Aquatics, go home. If we all have been a patient. You've all had family members, friends, if you see the bad, the good, and the ugly, write a letter. That's how you get PFAC. I'm also at Norris Cancer Center. I'm at Keck USC PFAC. I'm at Norris Cancer Center. Cancer survivors. We have diversity. We have different ages, input. Uh, you really have to think about your life priorities also. Maybe this isn't the time for you if you're too young. I didn't quite catch you about your income and all that other, I don't understand that part. A person comes to a committee to improve patient care and family information. That is the whole purpose of this. Working with different departments. Different departments sometimes are stuck in concrete. They don't want to move. They like their habit. If you show them the pros and cons of how we can go and help patients understand things, family members and friends information, you're going to have a better income, I mean outcome. Um, I don't care if I have an 18 year old with me and I have a 65 year old with me and we're on PFAC. Everybody has an in input. My husband had surgery at Keck USC, perfect surgery. We got there at 5 a.m. His four fellows in surgery did not come to the waiting room to tell me anything. That surgeon said, go tell Miss Murray, your husband's okay, the surgery went well, he's in recovery, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there at 8.30 in this lobby. Everyone's gone home. They're vacuuming. I thought they were coming to me because my husband was dead. They would not let me up on the floors where his surgery was, even to find him. The next morning, well, that night I went home and I wrote the CEO of Keck USC. And I did it in one sheet. And of course, people under him are not gonna tell him. I'll tell you a clue. You write a letter to someone, you put personal on the outside, only that person can open that envelope. I hand delivered it. They found me in his, my husband's room 
I went and met with the CEO of 101 of Keck USC, Dr. Handers. He apologized. The surgeon was there. His four fellows came in. Those four fellows, they couldn't demote them back to uh, residence, <laughs> but they're no longer on a surgery floor. They all thought it was great to have a little break before the next surgery. But that surgeon was so upset. I laid it out, the pros and cons of what happened, and he appreciated that. So if you want to make an impact, if you don't have time in your own lives or you're too busy with your families, write a letter of what you want improved, and there'll be actions because someone is going to read it and you took the time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And that's great that you took the time and hopefully that will impact many other people in the future. Um, I think on our side we've talked about, and every, I think everybody listed some of these um, as uh, barriers, such as you know, engagement, language is a big one, child care is a big one, time of council meeting is a big one. Um, no, access, we saw access to technology. Access, um, onboarding, we talked, and um, you know, the whole virtual hybrid in person and then training. Um, I think one thing I can encourage, like I can encourage is, uh, and we, we try all the time to be as creative as you possibly can. Um, I know I've heard of councils who ha have someone come and volunteer to do child care. They've worked a way to make it their child care available when their council meets. If you can't, if finding resources um, to help compensate people, maybe um, providing a meal, that's one. You know, there's a lot of ways to at least expand a little bit and then also trying to find, you know, making sure there are meetings held at a time of day that people can attend as many as possible. Um, or, or if they can't, finding another way for that voice to be heard. So seeking, you know, going outside of the box so we can make sure that we're really hearing every voice. Because not, not everyone even has the time, unfortunately, to write a letter. Some people really, or don't have the skill set maybe, but they have, or are afraid. So how do we get those voices that are really important um, heard? And so, and I feel like every one of us in this room is an advocate right, for, for all our communities. And I'm going to pass it on because Charlotte has more to share. So. so there's this really great video that we wanted to share with you to think of different ways to include diversity on your council. Um, we have an autism council, and I wanted to share some of their work. So we're not going to play all of it because of time, but just to give you a snippet of some of the work that you can do. I'm Alana Lee. I am the mother of Aaron Lee, who is now eight and a half, and he received an autism diagnosis through Kaiser uh, just a few months before he turned two. Aaron is not always immediately, obviously, autistic to everybody. Aaron. I'm Alana Lee. I am the mother of Aaron Lee, who is now eight and a half, and he received an autism diagnosis through Kaiser uh, just a few months before he turned two. Aaron is not always immediately, obviously, autistic to everybody. 
Aaron is extremely verbal. Um, he's highly intelligent. He, in many ways, acts like a typical kid. But Aaron's got a lot of anxiety about things. He tends to um, get stuck on ideas, especially if it's something he's worrying about. So Aaron does have some sensory sensitivities, like a lot of autistic children. Aaron really hated appointments when he was a lot younger, and we finally figured out it was because of the paper on the exam tables and the sound it made and the feeling. And it upset him so much that the minute we would walk into a medical building at Kaiser, he would start screaming. And once we figured it out, um, a one of the medical assistants said, oh, well, I can just take that off for you. I think the other piece that's important to realize about autistic children is they may not always present the way a typical child would. They feel things differently. He doesn't always look the way you would expect him to look when he's sick. We're lucky because we've had pediatricians who listen to us and take us seriously when we say something's up with him and they look deeper and try to figure out what's going on. So I just want to give you a little snippet. The medical appointments for my son are in. pretty Yep, and you're going to get all of our uh, emails, and I think probably the conference can give you that. So if you have follow-up questions or would like to see the slides yeah. and would like to leave, again, we're going to take these down and I'll transcribe them all so that you can get all of what the voices uh, here today said for this particular question. We'll have those for you. And then this is our contact information. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.